the science of getting rich. Further use of the will. You cannot retain a true and clear vision of wealth if you are constantly turning your attention to opposing pictures, whether they be external or imaginary. Do not tell of your past troubles of a financial nature, if you have had them, do not think of them at all. Do not tell of the poverty of your parents, or the hardships of your early life. To do any of these things is to mentally class yourself with the poor for the time being, and it will certainly check the movement of things in your direction. Let the dead bury their dead, as Jesus said. Put poverty and all things that pertain to poverty completely behind you. You have accepted a certain theory of the universe as being correct, and are resting all your hopes of happiness on its being correct. And what can you gain by giving heed to conflicting theories? Do not read religious books which tell you that the world is soon coming to an end. And do not read the writing of muckrackers and pessimistic philosophers who tell you that it is going to the devil. The world is not going to the devil, it is going to God. It is wonderful becoming. True, there may be a good many things in existing conditions which are disagreeable, but what is the use of studying them when they are certainly passing away, and when the study of them only tends to check their passing and keep them with us? Why give time and attention to things which are being removed by evolutionary growth, when you can hasten their removal only by promoting the evolutionary growth as far as your part of it goes? No matter how horrible and seeming may be the conditions in certain countries, sections or places, you waste your time and destroy your own chances by considering them. You should interest yourself in the words becoming rich. Think of the riches the world is coming into, instead of the poverty it is growing out of. And bear in mind that the only way in which you can assist the world in growing rich is by growing rich yourself through the creative method, not the competitive one. Give your attention wholly to the riches. Ignore poverty. Whenever you think or speak of those who are poor, think and speak of them as those who are becoming rich, as those who are to be congratulated rather than pitied. Then they and others will catch the inspiration and begin to search for the way out. Because I say that you are to give your whole time and mind and thought to riches, it does not follow that you are to be sordid or mean. To become really rich is the noblest aim you can have in life, for it includes everything else. On the competitive plane, the struggle to get rich is a godless scramble for power over other men, but when we come into the creative mind, all this is changed. All that is possible in the way of greatness and soul unfoldment, of service and lofty endeavor, comes by way of getting rich. All is made possible by the use of things. If you lack for physical health, you will find that the attainment of it is conditional on your getting rich. Only those who are emancipated from financial worry and who have the means to live a carefree existence and follow hygienic practices can have and retain health. Moral and spiritual greatness is possible only to those who are above the competitive battle of existence, and only those who are becoming rich on the plane of creative thought are free from the degrading influences of competition. If your heart is set on domestic happiness, remember that love flourishes best where there is refinement, a high level of thought, and freedom from corrupting influences. And these are to be found only where riches are attained by the exercise of creative thought, without strife or rivalry. You can aim at nothing so great or noble, I repeat, as to become rich, and you must fix your attention upon your mental picture of riches to the exclusion of all that may tend to dim or obscure the vision. You must learn to see the underlying truth in all things. You must see beneath all seemingly wrong conditions the great one life ever moving forward toward fuller expression and more complete happiness. It is the truth that there is no such thing as poverty, that there is only wealth. Some people remain in poverty because they are ignorant of the fact that there is wealth for them and these can be best taught by showing them the way of affluence in your own person and practice. Others are poor because, while they feel that there is a way out, 
they are too intellectually indolent to put forth the mental effort necessary to find that way and by travel it. And for these the very best thing you can do is to arouse their desire by showing them the happiness that comes from being rightly rich. Others still are poor because, while they have some notion of science, they have become so swamped and lost in the maze of metaphysical and occult theories that they do not know which road to take. They try a mixture of many systems and fail in all. For these again the very best thing to do is to show the right way in your own person and practice. An ounce of doing things is worth a pound of theorizing. The very best thing you can do for the whole world is to make the most of yourself. You can serve God and man in no more effective way than by getting rich. That is, if you get rich by the creative method and not by the competitive one. Another thing. We assert that this book gives in detail the principles of the science of getting rich, and if that is true, you do not need to read any other book upon the subject. This may sound narrow and egoistical, but consider, there is no more scientific method of computation in mathematics than by addition, subtraction, multiplication and division. No other method is possible. There can be but one shortest distance between two points. There is only one way to think scientifically, and that is to think in the way that leads to the most direct and simple route to the goal. No man has yet formulated a briefer or less complex system than the one set forth herein. It has been stripped of all non-essentials. When you commence on this, lay all others aside. Put them out of your mind altogether. Read this book every day. Keep it with you. Commit it to memory. And do not think about other systems and theories. If you do, you will begin to have doubts and to be uncertain and wavering in your thought, and then you will begin to make failures. After you have made good and become rich, you may study other systems as much as you please, but until you are quite sure that you have gained what you want, do not read anything on this line but this book, unless it be the authors mentioned in the preface. And read only the most optimistic comments on the world's news, those in harmony with your picture. Also, postpone your investigations into the occult. Do not dabble in theosophy, spiritualism, or kindred studies. It is very likely that the dead still live and are near, but if they are, let them alone. Mind your own business. Wherever the spirits of the dead may be, they have their own work to do and their own problems to solve, and we have no right to interfere with them. We cannot help them, and it is very doubtful whether they can help us, or whether we have any right to trespass upon their time if they can. Let the dead and the hereafter alone, and solve your own problem, get rich. If you begin to mix with the occult, you will start mental cross-currents, which will surely bring your hopes to shipwreck. Now, this and the preceding chapters have brought us to the following statement of the basic facts. There is a thinking stuff from which all things are made, and which, in its original state, permeates, penetrates, and fills the interspaces of the universe. A thought in this substance produces the thing that is imaged by the thought. Man can form things in his thought, and, by impressing his thought upon formless substance, can cause the thing he thinks about to be created. In order to do this, Man must pass from the competitive to the creative mind. He must form a clear mental picture of the things he wants, and hold this picture in his thoughts with the fixed purpose to get what he wants, and the unwavering faith that he does get what he wants, closing his mind against all that may tend to shake his purpose, dim his vision, or quench his faith. And in addition to all this, we shall now see that he must live and act in a certain way. End of chapter.